Thanks for tuning in and welcome to this episode of Crushing Big Data. I'm Tavo Delon, your host. I'm a big data solution architect and I want to share some of the things that I've learned in my travels uh, during the big data journey we've all been going through recently. So today's topic is about data modeling and big data. Now, there's a lot of controversy around this topic. Uh, there's those that believe that in the old world of the RDBMS, where we had strict data modeling confines, uh, that should be brought through to big data in some way, or that if it's not being brought through, it's just kind of a free-for-all, and anybody can grab any data, and there's really no way to um, come up with models uh, that are stable, reliable, uh, have data quality, etc. cetera. Um, but there's a lot going on there, so let's explore it. So why watch another video about big data? Well, I like to think that this one you're going to get high value techniques and methods that you can apply immediately. And that's really important in your job. Now, what, what are you going to learn in the next 10 minutes? So we're going to go about understanding the problem, the best practices, and then how to create a best in class model for big data that is flexible, extensible, and can be governed effectively. Who should watch this video? Well, if you're a programmer, a data modeler, an administrator, a chief information officer, a chief data officer, or just a big data enthusiast, this video is for you. So let's get started. So on the screen here, we have a very simple um, example of a high-level data warehouse reference architecture. And what we have is data flowing left to right, from the sources to the consumption layer, um, and then ultimately to the users. Uh, the data, as you note, is written many, many times. And by the time it gets to the consumption layer, it's often highly aggregated, meaning that you've lost the granularity um, and in many ways lost the individuality of the data, um, especially as that applies to customers and products and, and later on, especially when it comes to things like the Internet of Things. So this is the world of the data warehouse, and this is how it works. Uh, the raw layer that we have in the middle there is often an operational data store. Um, but as you can see, this is a lot of writing, uh, moving left to right. Um, so l let's talk about a, a couple of different things here. Uh, first, data schemas. So we, we now have a world where we have two different types of schemas because of big data technologies versus the RDBMS world. So in the RDBMS world, it's schema on write. So let's break that down. This means you define your schema, usually in an entity relationship diagram. Then you write your data and read your data, and it comes back in the exact same schema that you defined up front. So in other words, what you lay out in your design and ultimately instantiate on disk is a fixed structure. And every question that is asked is either helped or limited by that hard-coded schema. Now, in the world of schema on read, it's very different. And schema on read, you find more with the uh, big data databases. So in this case, schema on read is all about data stored without upfront de deciding you know, what piece of information is, will be important. Uh, it's a little scary, but you get all the data there that, from the source system that you pull it in from. Um, that data tends to be in a, its original granular format. It's the application, uh, the, the consuming uh, entity, the person, the person running the query, the, the, the web app, the, the reports that are being generated off of this. They apply a schema when the data is read. Now that's a very different kind of world because what's happened is, is you've, you've stored the data as it is and now an application development team rather than maybe data modelers, administrators, people that do data governance are now deciding what elements of that data are important to them. 
that's a critical step in taking advantage of the big data world, but it also is kind of scary uh, because you don't know who's going to grab the right data. And we're going to go through a couple examples here in a second. But the other thing to note here is other than our big data example that we showed before in the slide before, it's really in schema on read, write it once, read it many times. So how does that work? Well, in a data lazy architecture, you're trying to really enforce the write once, read many, many times. So data comes into a staging layer, and then automatically it goes into the data lake pretty much as it is, and it's consumable right there at that moment, the man moment it lands. Um, it's also co-located with data from other systems. Now, this is the exciting part. Um, so you're bringing together data that was separated by firewalls, was separated by uh, systems of record, uh, was separated by lines of business, uh, was just separated by different versions of the database. It all can now coexist in one large data lake. Um, and that's exciting because you then can have many applications running against it, pulling the data it needs at that moment in time. So it's the write it once and read it many times. So other than this being a radically different approach, we get to an example. So let's start with the example of we're working with a table called customer POS, which we brought in from a source system. And a table that we brought in, which we're going to work with as a document in JSON format here is provided us the first name, the last name, the address, and age of Katie Jones. So it's very basic here what we have. It's a very simple structure. So how do you begin to work with that? Because, you know, is that age correct? We don't have a, a birth date to compute it. It's just, an, is that age as of yesterday or is an age as of, you know, when Katie Jones signed up or was a customer for the first time? So it's a little, it's very ambiguous here as to what the data is in that particular case. So what we're doing with this is with this raw data, we're just trying to get into the data lake, but only once. Now, as we can move forward with this, we can start to add envelopes to the data that we've written in. Now, this is data that is augmenting what's happening in customer POS in this example. So this is enrichment. So we're taking the raw data and without changing it, leaving it in its granular format, um, we're now taking it and providing metadata. So for every document here, or, or that would be the equivalent of a row in an RDPMS database, we're going to show what the, the source is, which is POS North America, point of sale North America. The data was loaded, and if any transformations went on, and maybe the transformation went on, you know, check postal code or something like that to ensure that it matched up with the street address and the uh, city and the state. Um, so we are put this envelope around it for, you know, to get us some basic metadata here, but it also is starting to provide us some key points of lineage, like where did this come from, how did we get it, and what did we do to it when we touched it. So as we move forward, let's talk about co-location. So in this example, we see that another table has showed up in the data lake called web under our customer. And now we have them co-located, so it's, it's very exciting because you can do a query across them and get data. And again, we're back to Katie Jones. Uh, but in this case, in web customer, it's mainly, mainly about pulling in phone numbers, whether it's the home phone number or the cell number. And again, we need to go through that process where we add metadata. So again, the source system is understood. We know the date and the lineage in the sense of what transformation may have been performed there. So in this hypothetical example, let's assume that the transformation came through and made sure that the phone numbers were in the right um, um, st structures and uh, were normalized, you know, there was 10 digits, etc. So how do we build a canonical model on top of this? So ultimately, that's really what RDBMS worlds were building was canonical models, models that were, you know, canon law, 
canonical. Um, you know, that this is the way it is. How, how do you get meaning that these were the um, trusted sources of data? How do we get to that in a data lake architecture in a big data world? Well, it's really quite interesting. So let's go back to our data lake and the two tables we have in here. And I know this is a small example, but it's a very important one. So as we come through customer POS, we can do things like add in more enrichment, saying there's a canonical element to this database, and it's really about postal code being recognized by the organization or being recognized by the application developers as the way that they want to get to zip. And zip is the corporate standard that they want to use from a naming convention. You see that the data's there, right? But it's C under bar zip at this point. So that's the one canonical element that comes out of customer POS. Now as we move forward to web customer, uh, we see that the next canonical element has been added to this database. So it's all around the phone numbers. And um, again, they've decided that the uh, proper naming of this should be C under bar phone. And that's something that is a now a corporate standard. So in this small example here, we've seen where we have two canonical elements that can be pulled out. And it can be um, documented. It's very clearly understood what they are and we never touch the raw data that came in. Now, of course, we're repeating data, but we're repeating data here for the right reasons. Um, to get to this type of a model, um, to add a little bit more data to it, to add some more clarity to it, it's all for the good and the better. Um, there's plenty of disk space out there. These, these systems now scale quite uh, quickly with large data loads, and this really isn't a problem. This is more about organizing things so that um, we understand what the data can do. So how would this relate to what someone really needed in real life? So on the right-hand side, you're going to see that there's the answer to the thing in the middle, which is the business question. The question is, who is my customer? So in who is my customer, we see over on the left-hand side, the new customer POS, we pulled in the zip code, zip. And in web customer, we put, pulled in phone. And there was another source that we didn't talk about because didn't have enough room on the page. Uh, but let's just call it source A, where it's been uh, clarified that the canonical elements coming out of that are first name, last name, street, city, and state. When you look on the right-hand side of the screen, what you see is a virtual table that now exists inside the application after the query. So this is the whole schema on read part of it. And this is the, in a sense, the virtual uh, table that the application will use to go forward with um, the, the logic that's needed to solve uh, the next business questions. So in that case, we see that things have kind of changed a little bit um, from the examples we had on earlier slides. So it's really Catherine uh, Jones, not Katie. Uh, the street address is different. Um, and, you know, the, the phone numbers are there and the zip is there just as they were in customer POS and web customer. But the most important thing here is a new table was not created. There was no writing of a new table. This table is virtual. Um, it can be seen in the query that was executed against the three other tables. And that's really the exciting part of this is that you can write this data once. You can enrich it with metadata. You can enrich it with canonical elements that allow your organization to understand what data is valid, what data is suitable for purpose, and provide a way by which that data can be governed. But it's at the query level. So from a process and procedure point of view, it means that there's a lot more involvement uh, on the application devel development side uh, regarding these canonical models than in a traditional, let's say, RDBMS or even a, a data warehousing context where all of that happened up front even before the first query was written for the first application. Now the data is accelerating through 
the data lake, it's being made available immediately and with some care and enrichment, you can get it down to what are the canonical elements that are important. Now, it's quite possible that in this query they pulled in other data that was not canonical uh, or designated canonical um, from these same tables that were there. But in doing that, what they're, they're really doing is saying, I'm comfortable, this application is comfortable in this query with pulling this data in, in this context, it's suitable. And the documentation you have is the query itself. So this is the big change in modeling and developing canonical models within the big data world. So let's go back to our uh, tables again and look at it um, from a different point of view. So we've already explained the canonical elements to this. One of the biggest things that happens within um, a data lake is how do you link these canonical elements together, link customers together, link suppliers together, uh, the list goes on and on and on. And oftentimes you want to provide some type of unique ID. Well again, we want to try to do that in such a way where we're not creating new tables. Uh, so in this case, in the blue, you see there's a global piece of metadata that's been added, and it has the unique ID for customer POS and for web customer. So if you need to do a join, a bring together all the unique IDs that had all those nines, all those zeros, and all those ones uh, together to get back everything about Catherine Jones or Katie Jones, depending on what table you look at, you would have it there available to you. So this is the way to do modeling in the future. Now these are two simple tables, I, I agree. Um, but you can imagine as all the tables come in, it becomes pretty clear as you start to enrich them and look at them and add metadata to them, you start to decide what is canonical and what isn't canonical. In addition, it offers you the opportunity to say that maybe we have more than one type of canonical model. We have one for uh, sales reporting and we have one for uh, marketing and we have one that's used by the uh, chief financial officer in, in the work that he does and his group does. So you can build this out in a very logical way so that when you look into your data lake you can see what data is there, how it's been organized, but you can always drop down to the raw data as it was brought in untouched basically and see where it came from through its metadata and also by seeing it in its original form. This is the key advantage in using um, this type of data modeling uh, schema on uh, read and the ability to write this data once and rather than creating massive data structures around it, trying to bring order to the chaos, you work within the data structure to identify what is canonical, what is global, what metadata you want to add to it, and it's about enrichment. Now to do this uh, in a variety of different debate databases, whether it's on some of the Hadoop databases or the NoSQL databases, there's different constructs and techniques to doing this, but this is basically how it should be done. So the key learnings here are really this. With big data databases, they require a schema on read approach. That just has to be the way it is. Um, over modeling the data means you start to lose the granularity of it. Um, you start to manipulate it in such a way that you may change the meaning. And this is all happening based on business rules that maybe don't even apply to a particular use case yet or an application's need. And in doing this, you set up a situation which is actually fairly high performance in that you write the data once and you read it many times. This again is key to big data application development. If you're not operating in this way and working in big data, you need to look back and see how can you use these tenants uh, to go forward? 
and uh, build out a, um, a data lake, uh, an information hub, uh, an enterprise data hub. There's all kinds of different names for it. Uh, or just even your basic application where you're co-locating more than uh, one or two or three or four uh, divergent data sets that have never been together before. Now, this can help everyone from someone trying to do corporate reporting and BI reporting to advanced analytics. It can deal with everything from uh, EDW type uh, transactions and processes uh, to the Internet of Things. Uh, this is really how uh, the efficiency start and it starts with really how you think about the data. In big data, you have to think differently. You have to act differently and the data has to be instantiated in such a way that you can take advantage of not only the technology but the new ways to, to do application development. Really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, please send me comments. I'd love to hear from you about either this uh, episode or episodes you'd like to see in the future. So uh, have a great day and I'll see you again soon.